Hey, cheers guys, I'm the Tech Prepper. Hope you're all doing well. Today we're gonna to take a look at how I select my radios. I had a little problem that I was trying to solve with the Yaesu VX6, which is still my everyday carry radio. And it required me to take a look at some other radios on the market to solve this problem. So I thought it might be good to show you how I walk through my selection process. And to do that, we're gonna reach way over here and we're gonna take a look at the ICOM T10 and uh, why I actually evaluated this radio. So I get the question asked a lot, which radio do I get? And that will be different for everyone. And for me, it boils down to three things that I like to ask myself. One, what is the intended purpose for that radio? And what requirements do I need in order to achieve or fulfill that objective? Number two, what's my operating environment? And number three, what is my budget? So I'm gonna take these questions in reverse order, starting with budget. And for me, I'm actually fortunate enough right now at the point of my life and my career where I have the most flexibility when it comes to budget. So if I find a piece of gear that solves a problem, has value, I will absolutely pay within reason to be able to have that tool in my toolbox. All right, let's talk about operating environment. For me, this is very important, mostly because of my style of operation. I am primarily a field operator that is very active. I try to run at least five days per week, year around, and that includes our monsoon season that we just went through with heavy rains that just came out of nowhere, and then also very hot temperatures approaching 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So that, along with my level of perspiration, I actually sweat quite a bit. I will run with my VX6 chest mounted. So the amount of salt that builds up on my radio is extensive, along with the amount of moisture that is constantly dripping on this radio. So for me, uh, my environment really dictates more than anything else the gear. And that's why I'm such a big proponent of an IP67 uh, ingress uh, rating for uh, dirt, dust, uh, salt, moisture, all of that stuff. So this probably doesn't apply to most people. And what I find is a lot of people like to pick the same gear that I do, but they're usually operating in an urban environment and don't need that requirement. But number one, environment is at the top of my list in kind of filtering out radios right out of the gate, even before I get to my actual operating requirements. Before we jump into my operating requirements, I think it's more important to define the problem that I was having. So the Yesu VX6R has been my tried and true trail radio. It has a ton of miles on the order of several thousand, and it will continue to be my trail radio. I have an EDC one as well, and then one in my EMP kit that has largely gone unused. A new product entered the market a few months ago, and that is the DigiRig Lite. And what this device allows me to do is turn this dumb analog radio into something that allows me to have digital capabilities for Winlink email, APRS, and a slew of other modes. But what really makes it powerful is the ability for me to basically just introduce this cable with two pieces of gear that I'm already carrying with me. One is my radio and the other is my Android smartphone. So the big issue that I've had with the Yaesu VX6, and it's really the only drawback that I've run into, number one is the use of the threaded connector. And since this is an IP67 rated uh, device, they did make a smart call in having uh, basically a captive cover here that's threaded on that has a gasket to prevent any type of moisture from getting in there. In fact, I did a video uh, the first day I got this radio several years ago where I threw it in the pool and went for a swim with the pup. I'll link that one here. So in theory, it looks like a great design. And what I found was that the point of failure for this kind of digital integration is actually the cables. I've had an issue with the MobiLink TNC cable, uh, the cable from DigiRig, but basically any cable that uses this technique. And what I think has been happening is every time I put this on, or at least at the beginning, I would thread this on without taking off the antenna and I would essentially twist as part of putting that on the cable and it would die after about six months. I'm on my third or fourth one already. What I found is at least for the VX6, what I need to do, which is not ideal to ensure that I can extend the life of the cable is remove the antenna first and then take the VX6 cable and hold it from the housing and then insert and then apply pressure and twist the body of the radio and the cable at the same time. 
Since I've been doing that, there hasn't been a problem. And then I will thread back on whatever antenna I'm using. My concerns with this are is that I use digital every single day on my run and there is a finite uh, life for SMA connectors. So I will likely damage this over time. Also, it's not terribly field expedient to do this. So that was the driver. I wanted to find a, another solution similar to the VX6R that solved the ability to quickly connect and disconnect the audio interface uh, for use with the DigiRig Lite. All right, so with our problem defined now, let's go ahead and talk about the requirements. Again, the leading requirement here is the ability to have a way to do digital modes with the DigiRig Lite and do so in a way that one, is fairly easy to connect and disconnect, but also is secure. I've had an issue in the past with the Yaesu FT60 where that single 3.5 millimeter jack would actually back out and trigger the PTT and transmit a dead carrier. So the digital integration is really what is driving this next radio selection. Two, it has to be dual band. I need to do the things that I normally do on the amateur radio bands, and that's the ability to work two meters and 440 megahertz analog. Uh, digital would be nice, but it's not a requirement for this particular application. Now, it has to be rugged as my number three requirement, just based on my operating environment and how much torture and abuse my radios go through. And then an IP67 rating goes along with that, so it must have the ability to withstand lots of moisture, direct moisture, direct spray, submersion, all of that good stuff. Since this is an emergency radio and a backup communication device for me in the field, it has to be able to be Mars modded, which of course the VX6 is, and that will allow me in an emergency to transmit out of band. So I want to have interoperability with MERS, FRS, GMRS, and my commercial business frequencies. Uh, field charging is really absolutely key here. Uh, in the case of the VX6, I have the ability to uh, pair with it a AA battery tray. Now, while I don't get full power, it does allow me to make sure that if these batteries ever die, I can always buy batteries uh, basically anywhere to keep this guy going. Number two, the VX6 also has direct 12 volt DC charging. So since all of my amateur radio equipment uses 12 volts, I can actually use any of those batteries to charge this guy. I'm not really hot like all of the other ham nerds are on USB-C charging, but that would have been nice, but it's absolutely not a requirement. So field charging for me is absolutely key. And then last up, just simplicity and ease of use would be nice. So again, the VX6 does all of those things. It just doesn't do a great job in terms of the digital integration for me. With those requirements out of the way, I started to do my research and I started number one with uh, basically the digital interface and what I found was the ICOM T10 and what really drew me to this radio was the fact that it uses an L-type connector. Uh, it's not too different from the Kenwood style but in the case of the DigiRig cable that is available for the T10 you'll notice that we have this nice little connector and it drops right in so very quick to drop in it's actually pretty secure I mean if you tug it obviously it's going to come out so I don't compromise now the antenna. I don't have to remove it. Uh, the one issue that I did run into is that the IC T10 actually has a cap here that has a gasket and it has screws that require a flathead screwdriver. Uh, what I did is I did some research. I measured the screws and then found uh, these thumb knurlings and they go directly in there and it allows me to, when not using an accessory, to keep the factory cover on and then secure it with these aftermarket screws. If you have a T10, I'll put the link where I found these on Amazon. Uh, they work great. So a little bit of an extra step to remove and put that in. And again, there's a possibility of losing these, but ultimately I was able to get to a point where I could quickly, easily connect and disconnect and reliably have this connector. And then the other thing I did on my integration is that I made it captive. It's not permanent, I just put electrical tape between the DigiRig cable and the DigiRig light. So it was very quick for me to go ahead and get my digital modes up and running with my phone in the field. Next up was dual band operation on the amateur radio bands. And obviously this supports two meter and 440 analog on the amateur radio band. So check that one off as well. Now I'm gonna cover rugged construction and IP67 rating. Yep, this does both of them. What drew me to the 
T10 is that this is based on ICOM's commercial chassis, which is used as part of their uh, aviation lineup. So it just feels solid. The other thing I like about this, it has the feel of a commercial radio because it is. And all of the knobs are very tactile, um, especially the channel select has audible clicks. And I love that. That was one of the things that I loved about my Motorola 7550E series I was evaluating. So rugged, absolutely IP67 rating done, checked off the list. Next up is interoperability. And yeah, this supports the Mars cap mod. I had mine done by Gigaparts at the time of order, but HRO does it. The only thing to keep in mind is that it is the most expensive Mars cap mod I have seen, mostly because this is much more difficult to modify than the Yaesu radios, but it is supported. So I can now interoperate uh, with everything through FRS, MERS, GMRS, and my commercial frequencies. Before I forget on price, uh, the other reason that I actually went ahead and picked this one up, uh, I wouldn't have done it at the original price point of around 200 and I think it's 50-ish dollars. Gigaparts was actually running a sale uh, July 1st and I bought this for $100 off. So none of this would have been actually ever attempted at the current $250 uh, ish price point. So the reason why I decided to do this was because 150 bucks, it made sense because of all of these features. So field charging is very important for my style of operation. And this one is a big fail across the board. There is no support for an OEM or aftermarket AA or AAA battery tray. There is no support for direct 12 volt DC charging of the current battery, and there's no USB support. Now I forgave that temporarily because I thought, you know what, this radio has enough value where I can overcome all that stuff. Turns out I did a recent trip to Huntsville, Alabama for the ham fest. And it turns out that that was going to be a non-starter for me. There was no way in hell I was going to travel with the cradle and the uh, charging uh, adapter. I decided maybe I can solve this by basically solving it the way that I would a two way problem. I just need more magazines. Uh, for my carbine and for my pistol, so let's buy more. So the OEM battery is very expensive on the order of about $80, I think. Uh, don't quote me on that. So I bought a second battery. I also bought, on a chance, two knockoff batteries on Amazon. So a total of four batteries, but again, I'm gonna have limited um, runtime, you know, if on a five day trip, I may go through all of that. And again, did not want to bring the, uh, the cradle. I didn't do my research properly and I bought this thing called the AD149er Hotel. And what it is, is basically a 12 volt to 7 volt or 7.4 volt uh, converter. And it has a barrel connector to allow a 12 volt, 12 volt source. The challenge is there is no battery in here. So what you have to do, is we need to remove the battery connect up this guy, and then ICOM sells a very expensive cable that I wish that I did not buy that's fused that allows you to attach uh, whatever leads like power poles on the other side, and then you would connect this up. So kind of cool if you wanted to run power poles and connect this to maybe a distribution block, but hey, I've got mobile rigs for that purpose. So I had good luck recently with the QDX and using my talent cell and this little cable I found on eBay for a couple of dollars. And guess what? It works great. So I can take my talent cell now, flip it on, and now we can turn on our radio. Problem is who the heck wants to walk around with this thing? Uh, because again, it's not charging, it's just supplying 12 volts and converting it to seven volts, which the radio wants. So for all of these reasons, I decided that including this guy and this guy, the charging, or sorry, the um, programming cable and the hand mic just was a exercise in futility, again, for my purposes. And that's when I decided to basically initiate either a sale of all of these goodies for someone else who has different radio requirements and traded, or I'm going to trade all of this for two used VX6s. And unfortunately, I'm gonna to have to deal with uh, the threaded connector on the VX6. So guys, the purpose of this video was really just to share with you all of the things I think about based on my needs, my requirements, my budget, my operating location, and how I plan to use my radio. So this really isn't a review of the ICOM 
uh, T10. It's more of just the process I go through. So hopefully this will help you uh, take a look at what you need to do or what you want to accomplish in radio and figure out what works best for you. All right, guys, uh, I'm the Tech Prepper. Be strong, be safe, and be prepared.